Your Excellency, Dr. Taleb Rifai, the Secretary General of the UNWTO and the Guardian Angel of Global Tourism Worldwide. Your Excellency, Mrs. Janet Charette, the High Commissioner of Canada, who will be joining us in a moment. Susanna Sari, the Senior Vice President of Membership Development of Skull International. Honorable Ministers of Tourism, Mr. Louis Damore, Founder and President of the International Institute of Peace. Dr. Mario Hardy, the uh, CEO and President of PATA, our lovely Chairman of PATA, who's also joined us. Our friends and colleagues from the UNWTO, from the Global Travel and Tourism Community, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. It is a very warm welcome to you all to the 2016 World travel market IIPT event. This is very much a ritual for IIPT to be on one of the final days to bring together not just the minds of global tourism but the hearts of global tourism. And we do this at a very important time. It is my incredible honor to be your MC and panel moderator and time police and coordinator for the next little bit of time. Because as we all know, this is an event that has a remarkable ability to, in many ways, take all the busyness that we all experience at WTM and recenter not just how we think about world tourism, but how we feel about it. And as a result, the responsibility that each and every one of us have as leaders in our own worlds across the tourism world itself. Importantly, it's making sure that, as Dr. Refai always says, we turn that one billion plus opportunity of travel and tourism into a responsibility that we all, ho we all hold dear making sure that that responsibility is lived out so that we don't create a billion plus challenges to what tourism can do. We actually have to make sure that it mobilizes, ultimately, the ability to connect people with peace around the world. Today, as we look at our world and all of its realities, we come together with increasing awareness of the fundamental need to be able to look at our industry as a source of light at a time when there's a lot of darkness out there. It's a chance for us to look at why this industry matters as one of the only industries in the world that gets strangers to connect, that brings people and places together with a quest to find a common understanding and really identifying the fact that as much as we've said it for years and years that tourism is a vehicle for peace, we see it every day now with the changes that happen in the last 24 hours, in the last 24 months. We need this industry to help people of difference find that we're all the same. We have the same values, the same aspirations, the same desire for a better tomorrow, wherever we call home and to whomever we invite into our homes to understand how we live and why we look forward to tomorrow. The next hour is going to be a very special time because, ladies and gentlemen, we have come full circle. We are celebrating this year the 30th anniversary of the IIPT. IIPT featured in this year's World Travel Market with a very special milestone, and it is a very special gentleman in the front row who we have to thank for that, Dr. Louis, Louis de More. And you can't have a more appropriate person than the person who literally has love in their name. So he is our champion, and today we celebrate 30 years. We celebrate the moment on the eve of what is a remarkable opportunity for all of us in global tourism. Next year is the year in which the UN system worldwide, so every single UN agency across the world, is going to be focusing on tourism. And at the end of last year, it was declared that 2017 is going to be the United Nations International Year for Sustainable Tourism for Development. So every single UN agency coordinated by the UNWTO is going to be focusing on our industry. What that means is that we have 365 days of opportunity to get our message out, to get people to understand why this industry is about so much more than just the tourists. It's the impact that it has at economic levels, at social levels, at environmental levels, and importantly, at spiritual levels. This is our chance, and every single person in this room has to squeeze every moment out of those 365 days to make sure that we are playing our part in building our industry and helping and deliver in this the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The IIPT in this year's session will highlight the progress made in tourism as a driver of peace and sustainability over the last 30 years and the vision of industry leaders for the future. How do they see the next 30 years? How do we work through it to make sure that sustainable tourism is healthy tourism? 
for everyone, not just the tourists, but the places and the people where those tourists travel. IIPT takes particular pride in the fact that the concept of sustainable tourism was first introduced at the IIPT First Global Conference, A Vital Force for Peace, which took pl place in Vancouver in 1988. The IIPT subsequently pioneered a number of early initiatives towards its implementation. It was involved in the first code of ethics and guidelines for sustainable tourism. IIPT is behind the first international study of models of best practices around tourism and peace. The first international conference on sustainable tourism was in Montreal in 1994. Today, our dear founder and president of IIPT, Dr. Louis Damore, will be using this coming together to announce a very special reunion that's going to take place next year, the IIPT 30th Anniversary Global Summit and plans for the 30th anniversary year as a whole. What is the IIPT going to be doing to squeeze those 365 days and make them work for tourism as we all work for peace? Within this is a very exciting news about the fact that there will be a conference to be held in September of 2017 in Montreal, Canada, with the full support of the UNWTO under the theme of building susta a sustainable and peaceful world through tourism. But we will get into more of that later, because rather than mirroring, hearing my voice, you need to be able to hear the voices of the leaders who are going to take us into those next 30 years. So none of you are anyone who has plans on retiring in the next little while. We're going to make you reconsider that, please. Without further delay, I ask you please to welcome to the stage our keynote speakers who will be speaking one by one. We start with a gentleman who truly is a man who has taken our minds and tourism and all of our bodies and how hard we work, and he's fueled it with why we love tourism. He's given us permission in many ways to feel the love of what we do and to take that and get people excited about what they should see in the value of tourism. He is our guardian angel. He is an officer and a gentleman of global tourism. I give you with great love and affection, Dr. Talib Rifai, the Secretary General of the UNWTO, please. Thank you so much, Anita. Your role is very kind. My dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I feel a little bit at unease to be speaking in the presence of the real guarding angel of this whole thing, which is Louis D'Amore. He should be the one to introduce everything to us here. He always calls on us and the three of us sitting on that corner, David, Mario, and I, are known to be the three musketeers, but many people, we always try to do things together. We're trying to set an example of how we should be working together. But when Louis Demori calls, we always answer the call, Louis. Thank you so much for bringing all of us together. Louis has founded this wonderful organization more than 30 years ago, and it's still up and going so strong because it was founded on a real need and a real valid principle. Let me also welcome Janice Charlotte. I'm not sure if she's here already. Not yet, on her way. And of course, David and Mario, my co-partners. Susanna Sari, I just met you. I've heard a lot about you, and I'm very glad that we'll be sharing the stage together. But dear friends, it's an absolute pleasure to join you to celebrate IIPT 30th anniversary. Let me congratulate the Institute for their leadership and their tireless work in placing peace at the heart of tourism agenda. IIPT was born in 1986, according to our records. The year in which the United Nations and the global community celebrated what they declared at that very year, the year for peace. Over the past three decades, this organization has been at the forefront of promoting opportunities for building more peaceful society through tourism. It has managed to do one thing that we have always believed in at UNWTO, which is not to only talk about and promote and try to raise awareness about how to support this industry, which is important, but rather what can this industry do to support other aspects and other factors and segments in life that can make this world a better place. I think we should move from the concept of attracting attention to ourselves as an industry 
to still attract attention, but in how this industry can be used and utilized to become a force for good and a transformative power to make this world a better place. That is a fundamental transformation that needs to be done, and it's a fundamental concept that was realized by Louis d'Amore way 30 years ago. It is also very fitting that after 30 years now, we're celebrating next year an international year for tourism, sustainable tourism for the, for the, sur the service of development. So in 30 years, Louis, you have a very good record to be proud of. It is also seems to be very timely, and I did not have this on my script, I must admit, to have woke up this morning on news that's coming from a very important country in the world, the United States, about a major change and a major transformation in what's happening in that country, and to see how should we react to that and how should we do this. We, of course, many of us may be very concerned, but let me just shed a few thoughts off the script completely, and I'm risking of being politically incorrect. It's the only term I could use from the president-to-be of the United States. And I would like to say the following. Nobody that's on the wrong side of history has any chance to succeed. We need to be aware that history has this ability to correct itself always and to move us from one layer to another. We cannot at all retract or divert from the noble and the very important task that we're doing to keep our borders open, to keep people traveling, because the more people travel, the better this world becomes, definitely. We definitely all become better people when we travel. And nobody, just nobody, I can assure you this, it's going to stop people from traveling. No walls, how high they are, no matter who's going to pay for those walls, is going to stop people from traveling. People are going to defy walls, defy borders, defy restrictions, and continue to travel. Because that's the right side of history. That's where we should be heading. And through traveling, we are building a better world. We're, we're destroying all stereotypes. We're dealing with the most, most important deficit that this world is suffering from. I always say that the world suffers from so many deficits, economic deficits, technological deficits, educational deficits. But the most serious of all deficits is that of our inability to understand and accept one another and celebrate the beauty of our diversity. There's a surplus of bigotry in the world of today, and the modern technology, globalization, has accentuated that, for good or bad. We need to deal with it by the same medium that accentuated it. And we need to ensure that no, we're not going to accept us hating one another and building walls between each other. That is not going to happen, no matter what. And I assure you, anybody that looks at the history of mankind would believe that no distractions of history, as strong and as diverse as they may be, can maybe divert us a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, but they will always, world will always go back to what it really deserves to be. In the year 18, 1986, when IIPT was established, the world was suffering from so many of the global challenges. Terrorism was there, even, maybe even before, more than what it is now. We hear about it today more, but it has always been there. Environmental changes, environmental challenges, inequalities, geopolitical challenges were all there. Today, many of these global challenges remain, but we have to add to them some new of the world challenges, and we need to be aware of them. And the reason why I'm saying this in a forum that talks about tourism, because tourism is all about life, really. Nothing outside of our area of interest is not part of what we should be concerned with. Today we have a serious problem of refugees, for example, which is affecting, interacting, and diverting our energies, sometimes in a wrong way, towards what travel and tourism is all about. 
we still are suffering, and even more than before, from a jobless global economic recovery. An increase in fear and intolerance, more than 30 years ago, without doubt. So more and more IIPT is needed, and what you are trying to promote, Louis, will continue to be even more important in the days to come. IIPT has shown the world that tourism is a pillar for peace and a cornerstone for development in creating jobs, reducing inequalities, creating more prosperous and stable societies, and improving life. And without doubt, that's the basis, basis of peace. It's a powerful transformative force, this tourism industry of ours, that broadens our minds, breaks down barriers, and builds bridges between people, communities, and nations. A force that promotes tolerance and understanding while contributing to sustainable development. Because, my dear friends, there is no peace without stability. There is no development without stability. And there will be no travel and tourism as such without development angle to it. Every traveler can be a global ambassador of peace. There is no time to spread this message. There is no better time to spread this message than now, as our, as our world continues to struggle with conflicts and intolerance and prejudice. IIPT and UNWTO are united in working to promote tourism as a vehicle for towards culture, a culture and a mindset for peace. This, this is why we'll always be supporting you, Louis, and supporting what you're doing. My dear friends, this is not the time to sit down and count whatever goes wrong in our world. It's the time to think of how beautiful this world is and how much it deserves of us to work towards making it more beautiful. And as a matter of fact, I truly and honestly believe that we're living in the best of times. We're living in a beautiful world. We may be distracted if we feel victims of listening to the news every morning and seeing how disturbing things in the world are happening. But think about it in a different way. We hear more about each other. We care more. Therefore, it is a better world. When girls are kidnapped in Nigeria, they become our girls. We heard about it. They are part of our problem. When an earthquake hits Japan, Ecuador, or Nepal, it hits each and every one of us. We hear more, we're connected more, we care more. It is a better world. And it's a world that deserves all our giving, all our attention. It's a life that's worth living. Let's count our blessings. Let's move forward. Let's move with hope, optimism, because our industry is one of smiles, hopes, and optimism. This is the nature of our industry. Let's all work towards it. Let us not ever fall victim of pessimism and be distracted by the negative news because to me, to us, they're just news. Thank you very much. Dr. Rifai, thank you very much. And thank you for, as always, being able to articulate when emotions are high and it's hard to find the words. In terms of hard to find the words, introducing our next speaker, who is a very special man when it comes to the balance of global travel and tourism. I, I looked to him and I realized that I only did half of my job, bless you, with the protocols when I introduced him, because I recognized I needed to introduce next the half-brother of Dr. Taylor Rifai. He is the president and CEO of the WTTC, one of the most important private sector entities that we have in our global industry, truly bringing together business and entity champions to make sure that we have a balanced approach to growing through tourism through governments and through business. The second hand that claps with Dr. Rifai, it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage Mr. David Scousel, the president and CEO of the WTTC, please. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Louis, for your kind invitation to be here. My half-brother, my cousin Mario, and fellow speakers, uh, it's always good to be here on the stage with you. Although WTTC is best known for its economic research for the sector, we've also been exploring the link between tourism and peace for many years. 
We've hosted a number of world leaders at our global summits, including Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, and it was Bill Clinton that identified for us the importance of tourism and cultural understanding as a manifestation of peace. At our inaugural Asia Summit in Seoul, Tony Blair picked up the theme, summoning the spirit of President Kennedy, which talked of tourism as a driver of peace, security, and understanding. Free movement of people is one of the founding principles of the European Union. The more people traveled, the greater their understanding of different cultures. The more understanding, the less chance of war, the less chance of political conflict, and so much has changed since 1900. Intellectually, it's always felt right that tourism should be considered as a driver of peace. The anecdotal evidence felt compelling, but we wanted to see if the actual data told the same story. So we teamed up with the Institute for Economics and Peace, which publishes annually the Global Peace Index, and together we considered the correlation between peace and tourism across 106 countries, over a period of about eight years. Comparing tourism data to the Global Peace Index showed there's a clear link between more sustainable tourism and more peaceful societies. And peace is not just the absence of violence and war. It thrives on the existence of attitudes, the institutions and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. Positive peace, as we call it, consists of a number of areas which are fundamental to peaceful societies. A sound business environment, free flow of information, high level of human capital, an equal distribution of resources. And it's in this area that the link between tourism and peace is strongest. Countries with a more open and sustainable tourism sector have higher levels of positive peace. Our study showed that tourism can and does contribute to peaceful societies. It also showed that for this positive relationship to exist, the practice of tourism has to be open and sustainable. And this is not just about numbers, it's about how tourism is developed, managed and delivered. More tourism does not lead to more peace. Better tourism leads to more peace, and better tourism is sustainable tourism. This is the message that we now take to government leaders. In the last five years, Secretary General Rifai and myself have visited over 80 heads of state to communicate directly with presidents and prime ministers the benefits of travel and tourism. And as well as describing those economic benefits and those job creation benefits, we're increasingly telling the human story that this sector is indeed a driver of peace and sustainability. At our global summit earlier this year in Dallas, ocean campaigner Fabienne Cousteau said, I look forward to the day that there's no sustainable tourism, just tourism. So we need to re redefine how we think about tourism and tourism growth, and that redefinition needs to have sustainability at its heart. And we need to constantly ask ourselves the tough questions, not just to ourselves, but to everybody that works around us the CEOs, the government ministers, businesses, local authorities. How do we deal with the impacts of climate change? How do we ensure that positive impacts are spread widely and the negative impacts on our industry are minimized? And how do we deal with destination management in the future where tourism potentially can overwhelm destinations? And how do we make sure we have the systems in place to cope with two billion international travelers. One of the biggest challenges for the future in travel and tourism, and for all those involved in ensuring that it is sustainable, it's engaging everyone in this agenda. To make a difference, we need to inspire everyone. That's one of the reasons that WTTC has its Tourism for Tomorrow Awards program. These awards represent the very best, the gold standard in sustainable tourism recognizing environmentally sustainable operations, the protection of culture and natural heritage, social and economic well-being of local people in travel destinations around the world. Taleb has talked about the implications of the election in the US. I think when you stand back and look at this, the early days of the Obama administration, it took the industry some time 
to make the US administration understand the impact of travel and tourism in that country, both for jobs and job creation. The advantage we have with a new president-elect is he actually comes from our industry. He runs hotels, he runs leisure operations. He has an understanding already about our industry. And in some of his public statements in his speech of acceptance this morning, he was talking about the need to build infrastructure, to build airports, to build rail, to build road networks. So I'm sure that when he puts people around him in his administration, we will see a very smooth link between one administration and another with regards to our travel and tourism industry. And finally, let me pay tribute to the Inst International Institute for Peace through Tourism for its inspiring work over the last 30 years. Louis Damori has done amazing things. Today we're talking about peace and the sustainable tourism, subjects which have been at the heart of IAPT agenda for longer than most other organizations in the world. Today, every tourism business is committed to improving the quality of the environment, the preservation of heritage, and fostering international understanding. Today, the world's travel and tourism leaders are personally committed to making the world a better place through the integration of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals across all of their operations. 30 years ago, few people had that vision, so we all owe a tremendous debt to Louis and his team for their groundbreaking work over these years. And finally, there is a human side to tourism. Travel and tourism brings people together. It puts a smile on people's faces. It alleviates poverty, provides employment across all levels of society and in some of the most remote places on earth. It fosters respect and understanding. It truly does make the world a better place, and it certainly makes the world a more peaceful place. Thank you. David, thank you very, very much. It is now my great pleasure, despite how your feet are hurting and how tiring WTM has been for its running around the tourism casino of the world, and as much as you're thinking, this has been a very demanding few hours, it is my pleasure to introduce to you someone who I think is probably the hardest working person in the room right now. She is the beautiful High Commissioner of Canada, who, as you know, that specific office has taken on a particular value in the last 24 hours to the point that your website has crashed, apparently. And I can say that as a Canadian who's holding my passport tight. But it is my great pleasure to introduce to the stage Her Excellency, Mrs. Janice Charette, the High Commissioner of Canada. Madam, we welcome you. Thank you very much, and my apologies for arriving late and disrupting the, uh, the earlier speakers, uh, particularly my predecessor here on the stage, uh, for his remarks. I really am delighted to be here as part of the panel, and I wish I could tell you that the reason I was delayed is because I was back at the office answering the phone for immigration calls, <laughs> but unfortunately it was London traffic that was uh, in fact the victor of my day, one and a half hours from Trafalgar Square. So. Uh, perhaps that should be a topic for another conversation around sustainable tourism and traffic, alas. Um, I, am, uh, I do regret, unfortunately, that I wasn't able to hear some of the earlier speakers, and I hope that, uh, that uh, I know I had some, some members of my team in the audience, uh, and I look forward to hearing a bit more from them. Alors, pour moi, c'est vraiment un plaisir d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui pour avoir l'occasion de vous parler de la pratique de Canada dans ce domaine. It's a pleasure for me to be with you here today and talk to you about uh, how Canada sees this particular topic. Um, let me just uh, say, uh, add my words of thanks uh, to the president of the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism, Louis Damour, for inviting me to be part of this panel and for all of the hard work that he has done and his leadership of the Institute. As the Institute, I believe, has just announced, the 30th Anniversary Global Summit will be held in Montreal, the beautiful Montreal, Quebec, Canada, from September 17th to 21st, which will coincide with the UN International Day of Peace and is there ever a more fitting time for this kind of an event. We are absolutely delighted to be able to welcome this conference back to Montreal. 
Some of you may know that Canada and the Institute have strong links dating back to when the Institute was founded in Montreal in 1986 during the UN International Year of Peace. In fact, Canada played host to the first Institute Global Conference, which was held on the West Coast in Vancouver in 1988, and the second Global Conference held in Montreal in 1996. As well, in 1991, on the Institute's 15th anniversary and in the year Canada celebrated 125 years since uh, our birth and confederation, the Institute organized the Peace Parks Initiative across Canada. This saw 400 in cities and towns across the country dedicate a peace park at the same time the National Peacekeeping Monument in our national capital of, of Ottawa was unveiled. Today, Canada continues its commitment to peace building and sustainable development both key principles which are guiding this discussion. Today I have three messages for you. First, Canada is a wonderful country to see and experience sustainable tourism. That's the commercial part. Second, sustainable tourism is expressed through a number of lenses, environmental, social, and economic, and I'll touch on those. And third message, 2017 is a great year to experience this in uh, uh, firsthand in Canada as it will be our 150th birthday or sesquicentennial. So let me start with the first, uh, our, our vision of, uh, of uh, sustainable tourism, starting through uh, an environmental lens, uh, because Canada is working hard to practice sustainable tourism um, when you think about it through that particular uh, filter. Canada is the world's second largest country, as many of you know, with the world's largest coastline, longest co coastline, and 20% of the world's fresh water. Our land and marine environments are cherished by Canadians and are an important part of our legacy to future generations. Canada's first national park was established in 1885, and we established the world's first national park in service in 1911. In fact, that Park Service, which is now known as Parks Canada, was established to protect sites of natural wonder and provide a recreational experience centered on the idea of the natural world providing rest and spiritual renewal from the urban setting. In other words, Canada was practicing sustainable tourism over 100 years ago. And any of you who have had a chance to visit any of Canada's national parks, whether it's beautiful Banff, uh, the Grossmoor National Park in Newfoundland and Labrador, up in the Torn Gap Mountains, wherever it may be in the country, hopefully you have found that those were an oasis where you could actually find that, that opportunity for renewal. Canada now has one million square kilometers of land and waterways, along with over 50,000 square kilometers of marine environment with protected status. The total area of protected land in Canada now represents an area close to the size of the whole province of Ontario, which itself is four and a half times the size of the United Kingdom, and this area continues to grow. The government review, really views our parks as a great resource for Canada and for visitors alike. And in fact, next year, to help celebrate the 150th uh, anniversary of Canada, there will be free admission for all visitors to our national parks, national marine conservation areas, and national historic sites. And this will remain free for all children under 18, beginning in 2018. And so I hope that this, this is a, a good example of how um, we're using our environmental assets, which are truly a great blessing to our country. And we're using them in new and different ways in, in terms of trying to encourage uh, people from all over the world to try and come and experience um, an, experience, an experience outside of uh, an urban community. But sustainable development is about more than having a, um, a magnificent uh, God-given environment. We recognize the uh, important uh, value that sustainable tourism can bring on the economic side to communities, particularly through job creation, but also through the opportunity to uh, experience uh, and uh, enjoy the, op the, the uh, opportunity to, uh, to see the lifestyle, the culture, and, uh, and the diversity of Canada and our values up close. The Canadian government continues to support communities, both small and large, with financial support in order to collaborate, develop, and execute sustainable tourism plans uh, right across the country. And so that support really is designed to try and allow communities to seek economic opportunity through tourism. And there are a number of parts of the country for which this is actually a significant part of their economic development strategies. 
Aboriginal tourism is another priority for the Canadian government in an area where the federal tourism minister, uh, Chagger, has taken a strong leadership position, working with, federal, uh, working with provincial and territorial tourism ministers in Indigenous communities. In fact, the Aboriginal Tourism Association of Canada was created to improve the socioeconomic situation of Canada's Aboriginal people, including First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. They work with Aboriginal tourism operators and communities to start a cultural tourism business. And in fact, this association, along with Aboriginal Tourism British Columbia, are exhibiting here at WTM in the Canada Pavilion. And if you haven't had a chance, I know I hear you have tired feet and probably tired brains, but if you haven't had a chance to visit the Canadian Pavilion, I really encourage you to do so. I think we have some fabulous exhibitors here who would be delighted to tell you more about the experiences available in Canada, including on the Aboriginal tourism side, which I would suggest to you as an opportunity, which we see to de for economic development within those communities, but also offers a very interesting, and I would argue a, a unique uh, travel opportunity experience to see a part of Canada and experience a culture and a lifestyle which is only available in those communities. Uh, as, my, as the speaker before me was speaking, uh, I, I also want to endorse uh, the thematics that I heard him expressing, which is really the importance on the social and the cultural and the diversity side of tourism as an opportunity for building understanding. Through travel, uh, we can experience culture, we can uh, contribute uh, and have those different kinds of experiences, and those opportunities will build mutual understanding. That mutual understanding that helps to build tolerance and acceptance at a time when I think we can all agree the world could use a little bit more of that. My last, my last area is uh, why 2017, uh, which is, uh, because of our sesquicentenary, a great year to experience this firsthand. I invited you all to participate in Canada uh, and visit us in 2017, both for the IITP Global Summit in September, as well as to experience some of these sustainable tourism experiences firsthand. Uh, for our 150th birthday, we, were, we are planning a year-long celebration uh, that will uh, begin in January and last through the whole year in order to mark the anniversary of our Confederation and the birth of the nation. We'll have celebrations right across the country from small community events right up through to, to grand, uh, glorious national celebrations to mark this important milestone in our history and celebrate our proud history, but also um, the aspirational future uh, that Canada is trying to create, a country uh, which celebrates and values diversity as a strength and an asset, where we are trying to be a model of tolerance and where we are trying to welcome peoples from around the world. As I said, we're going to have feature events right across the country, and the capital city of Ottawa will have uh, a, a, a very heavy uh, component of celebrations as part of this program. As well, the City of Montreal, which will be the host for next year's uh, Institute uh, Conference, will have a double, double celebration because in addition to celebrating the, the 150th birthday, Montreal will also be celebrating its 375th anniversary with a number of events over the course of the year, focusing on history, on art, music, and culture as one of North America's oldest cities. On peut aussi avoir une expérience dans les deux langues canadiennes. On a, on a un, un, un opportunité d'expérience de, de la qualité de, de dualité linguistique au Canada pour avoir une visite à Montréal. It will also be the 50th anniversary of Expo 1967 with the theme then described Man and His World. Maybe we'll call it Person and His World now, but I think it is a, a glorious succession actually of a celebration of, uh, of a progression of Canada's growth over that time. Two weeks ago, The Lonely Planet, The Traveler's Bible, identified Canada as the best country to visit in 2017 and noted that a lot is happening in our country in that year. So there's going to be a lot to enjoy. Um, invi I would invite you very much to come and visit uh, the organizations that are featured in the pavilion. Uh, and as I understand it from talking to uh, travel organizers and uh, travel planners, uh, buy your tickets early because the hotels fill up very quickly. Uh, and it will be an absolutely amazing year. We look forward to welcoming you to see sustainable tourism uh, through a Canadian lens in 2017. Merci beaucoup à vous tous. Your Excellency, thank you very, very much. If there's anything that we understand about peace, it's the importance of words. 
and making sure that we don't apply labels to people that strip them of their identity, of their dignity, and of their respect. We use words now like refugee, which loses the courage and, the, again, the dignity of the people that these represent, migrants. One of my least favorite words in marketing has become millennial because we take away the fact that we're just making a generic statement about people who happen to be a certain age. And there's one person in particular whose heart's starting to probably pump a little bit because he gets nervous when I introduce him. He's proven that being a millennial has nothing to do with age. And I'm not saying you're old, I'm just commenting. But it's actually about a mindset because he is the most gadget-connected, truly youthful, whoops, I beg your pardon, youthful hearts I've ever met in the tourism industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the millennial mindseted Dr. Mario Hardy, CEO and President of PAPA. I do get nervous actually when you introduce me. There's some inside stories which I won't share with you today. Your Excellency, Madame Charret, bonjour. Dr. Rifai, David Scalzel, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I think there's a reason why Anita always put me at the end. She knows my speeches are very short, and also that I share personal stories that kind of become a norm of my different stories I share with you. So I'd like to do the same thing today and actually share something a little bit personal. And I'll start with a quote. Don't ask me where I'm from but where I'm a local. This is a quote from a lady called Tai Selizi, a Nigerian photographer and writer. And this represents me very much. When someone asks you where you're from, do you sometimes know what to answer? And quite often I don't. I get asked this question nearly every day. It may be because most people can't figure out my accent and where I'm from. But I'm a multi-local, I'm a digital nomad who feels at home in the town where I grew up, the city I live now, and the countries I travel to. I lived on three continents, and I lived in seven countries so far, and I've traveled to 83 so far countries as well. I spend my life on airplanes, as Dr. Rifai does, probably a little less than him, but very close and probably as much as David as well. The three of us spend probably most of our time not in the country where we're born, or not the country where we live, but in someone else's country. To me, man created borders, man created nationalities, man created passports, but I was born a citizen of the world. And I think it is, as it was said before by Dr. Rifai, it is a basic human right to travel the world freely. When I hear words of walls being built, when I hear words of visa enforcement, it makes me nervous because I want to continue to travel the world. I want to continue to travel and discover this beautiful world of ours. When I was a child, my mother subscribed to a club, the Explorer Club. And every month she would take me to see one of the movie and an explorer would actually come and talk to us all about all the beautiful places that he actually visited. He would introduce us a new culture, a new country. And as a child, I was dreaming of one day of this, discovering all of these beautiful places. The diversity that we have, the uniqueness that we have in each of our respective cultures is what makes our world so good. I'm a better person because I travel. And I borrow these words from Dr. Rifai. But I truly believe I am a better person because I have traveled so much. So I'd like to encourage all of you to continue to explore this beautiful world that we have, to continue to travel, to continue to encourage people to travel. And for those of you who are in power, please, please stop putting barriers for people to come and visit your country. Encourage them, because this knowledge that we gain from the mix of different cultures makes us a better person. So thank you very much for your time. Mario, thank you very, very much. Interesting, because Mario said that he's going to get the last word, and he knows me very well, but he also knows how much I love his wife. 
And with that, he knows that I'm not giving you the last word, I'm giving the beautiful woman the last word. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the newly minted Senior Vice President of Membership Development of Skull, Ms. Susanna Sari. Madam, the stage is yours. Thank you, Anita. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I have to say I'm very nervous now. Um, I feel very small. I'm, I'm six feet, 180 centimeters, but I feel small and humble after all these uh, great speakers before me. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Skoll International, um, are we going to get the picture that I send? Will it be shown? I'm not sh sure. Uh, Skoll International is a, is a professional organization of tourism leaders around the world promoting global tourism and friendship. And I think friendship is a word and concept that is ageless. We are basically the only international group that unites all the brands of travel and tourism industry. And our members are industry managers and executives who meet at local, national, regional, and international level. The cooperation with IIPT and SCOL has started almost 20 years ago. Uh, in Well, actually, more than 20 years ago, in 1994. And we have come together as, as partners for a series of projects, uh, the first and foremost of which is the IIPT and SCOL B Cities, Towns and Villages, which was launched in 2013. Its aim is to promote um, peace from village to nation level. We're also working together in uh, Expedition 196, where uh, Ms. Cassie de Pacol is now visiting uh, 196 nations in three years, and SCOL has been very root level um, operator in this um, project, so we always try to help her when she comes to a particular country or region. Um, okay, here we go. Um, I just came back from our 77th World Congress, which was held in Monaco less than a week, oh, well, a week ago, and, and you can see a picture in the background from the Sustain Sustainability Awards ceremony, which we held on Sunday the 30th uh, of uh, November sorry, October, at the Grimaldi Center. Uh, following the United Nations Declaration of uh, 2002 as the year of ecotourism and the mountains, Skoll International launched the Sustainability Awards in the same year to highlight and acknowledge best practices around the globe. Um, the Sustainable um, Tourism Awards while highlighting the best practices in tourism around the world also serve the purpose of acquainting the world with, its, uh, with this concept that puts emphasis on the importance of the interaction of the physical, cultural and social environment. The traveler's responsibility and the need to, uh, to active uh, community participation for sustainability. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, but any company from the public and private sector, NGOs and government agencies worldwide are welcome to submit an entry in one of the nine available categories. And those categories are tour operators, uh, rural accommodation, urban accommodation, transportation, countryside and wildlife, marine, community and government projects, major tourist attractions and educational institutions, programs and media. And in the picture, you, you see the, uh, the winners in, in eight categories this year. And I'm actually very glad to say that there are two Canadian winners in the group here. Um, uh, if I just quickly tell you who these people are, we had winners in, um, from Andaman Discoveries in Thailand, Hotel Verde in South Africa, Simeon Lodge Community Projects from Ethiopia, Biosphere Expeditions from United Kingdom, Pennicut Wilderness Journeys from Australia, Maya Kayan from Mexico, Azinibuan Park Cons Conservancy from Canada, and Community Based Tourism Vietnam Project also from Canada. So very global in this respect as well. And for, for next year, as Anita was saying, and, and we all know the, the UN theme year, we are looking forward to launching uh, an ex, um, sort of an uh, extra theme award as well, but we are still working on it, so I, I don't exactly know what it will be yet. I would like to end with the note that Skoll International will continue promoting its core value, which is friendship. Our Amical, as our founding members in Paris in the early 30s put it, we truly believe that via friendship starts understanding that will lead to peace. Thank you very much.
Susanna, thank you very, very much. And to all of our speakers, we thank you dearly and very much for setting, helping us set the scene and get a sense of how really do we embrace this subject and make it work for us forward. With that, we're going to do a little bit of a transition now and have a panel discussion with three of our speakers. Please may I ask to join us back on stage, the, uh, Her Excellency from the uh, Jani, or sorry, beg your pardon, Janice Charette, the High Commissioner of Canada. Madam, if you can please take one of the seats, that'd be fantastic. Susanna, can you also please join us back on stage, and Dr. Mario Hardy, I'd be very grateful. We thank you very much. Excellent. I'm going to do some walking and talking now for the next little while. We have with us next year, as we said, an opportunity to really leverage the fact that the entire UN system and the entire tourism world is going to be looking at our sector and really seeing it as an absolute vehicle for, for driving sustainable tourism for development, sustainability of peoples, of culture, of economics, of social integration, of peace. My question to all three of you is, we have 365 days. How do we use these? We are, as we say, talking in the church. We are all the converted. How do we make sure that people who are not necessarily one of the sector is able to understand, embrace, and carry our message forward whatever their world of operation might be. Your Excellency, your thoughts. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. I think it's, uh, uh, it, it's a very uh, astute question to be asking because um, too often we, we look at rooms like this, which is, as you say, uh, all the people who are already converted to the cause. Um, and uh, 365 days may seem like a long time, but it really will go by very, very quickly. Uh, my suggestion is, uh, is twofold. One of them is focus, and that is you have to think very carefully about what your single overriding objective is for that year. How are you going to define success and make sure that your activities are all aligned to that singular focus? It's not a lot of time, and so I don't think you can actually uh, achieve uh, multiple objectives. I think you really want to use it as a as a foundation. My second piece of advice is communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, because um, I don't think that you can take it for granted that people will not necessarily understand what it is you're trying to achieve, how the pieces fit together, and what, if I can say it, is in it for them, why it's important and why they should be paying attention. And so I would say, when you're sick of hearing yourself talk about it, you may actually be just starting to penetrate mm -hmm. the consciousness of others. And so um, communications, I think, is, is really critical. Lovely, thank you. And thank you for your honesty in saying that we do need to position it from the point of view of the benefits of the audience that we're trying to engage. Absolutely. Because they might appreciate our story, but it's not necessarily in their interest to drive it. Right. But if we're driving their agenda, fabulous, it will make sense. Mm -hmm. Susanna, what can you add on top of that? Yes, well, in my private life, uh, because Call International is actually a hobby, a very work some hobby, but it's a hobby. I'm, a, I'm an academic and I teach in an applied science university. And um, I'm still really, you know, thinking how come this is not a, a default thing, you know, because I remember 20 years ago when I started studying uh, after coming back from the industry, I was, you know, excited and we're still talking about the same issues, just like you said, you know. Um, so I think Education is still the key in, in, in many respects. We need to educate our customers, but we also need to make sure that we educate the people who work in the industry and, and those around and, and those who are in the, in the same supply chain so that everybody understands. And it has to be very simple. I still remember something I, I, I saw um, 30 years ago in, in the Caribbean. There was a little bit of bed and breakfast um, with a, a shower that you had to share. And because they didn't have that much water on that island in St. Thomas, they had a, a, a beautiful little sign that said, please help us save water, have a shower with a friend. And that was uh, <laughs> something I still remember. And it, it, you understand it, and it's to the point, and it's the, the whole thing. Brilliant. <laughs> That's a, uh, we talk about connecting when we travel. That's a way of doing it. And doing it clean, <laughs> that's fine. But I think what's also important is that, to your point, Madam, about communication, right. and you're linking it now to education, mm -hmm. even the word sustainable has so many defi different definitions, mm -hmm. and people often default to think it's green. 
And it's not necessarily just that. Yeah. So simply being able to communicate clearly what do we mean mm -hmm. when we talk about sustainable tourism and making that work further. Dr. Hardy, your point of view, especially tapping on your experience, because you've already done quite a bit in this regard. I, I think you know, uh, starting with the communication is very important and, and the sharing of knowledge and stories and practical examples like taking a shower with someone else or, <laughs> or other examples of that nature. But I think that's, that's where we're lacking is if you start with small steps and show people how to do it and give them a case study, a real example of how to do things, mm -hmm. it starts to change. Uh, they say that in order for someone to change a habit, you need to do it 16 times. Mm -hmm. um, and we started in our own office uh, last year as we wanted to be certified, EarthCheck certified, uh, for our own premises as we, are, you know, we should be leading by example. Mm -hmm. We put a little team together and we talked about what are the little things we can do in the office, switching off the lights when we leave the office, switching off our computers, uh, consuming less paper, recycle wherever we can. There are small steps, but what I've noticed over the last 12 months is that our staff now are getting more aware of it and we keep talking about it mm -hmm. and they're practicing every day and no doubt they're going home and starting to think oh maybe I should switch off the water one brush my teeth and and little things like this and if we do one step at a time we can actually improve things mm -hmm. and, and you're a great example Mario of a child teaching the parents mm -hmm. can you please explain what you've done with your board with respect to documentation <laughs> yes um, I have to say I was challenged a little bit actually from our own staff at the beginning not from a, essentially our board but we we used to have and at our board meetings um, and our council we have uh, sometime up to 80 100 people 120 people attending mm -hmm. Uh, those are just for the, the board proceedings and outside of that there's even more. But as you can imagine, we went to these meetings with these stacks of board papers about this thick and we used to pay thousands of dollars to ship it around the world and to print it and a lot of man hours in printing all of these documents. And then one day we just said, no more. We will go entirely digital. We didn't ask permission, we actually just did it. So we came up to the board meeting a few weeks before, we announced everybody that we will be going entirely digital. If you wish to print something, if you absolutely must print something, print it on your own, bring it with you, or print it on site. We won't stop you from doing it, but we will not print it for you. Um, and you know, our staff was very nervous. They said, oh, what do we do if someone asks for it? They say no. You just plainly say no. And you explain the reason why we say no. And it wasn't actually that much challenge. We, we expected people would be complaining about it, but actually, no, it went very smoothly. Everyone came prepared. They had their laptop, their computers, their phone, their iPads, whatever, tablets, and came prepared for it, and now it's a norm. It's accepted, and if we print something, actually our board is saying, why have you printed this? Mm -hmm. So you, you, yeah. you, you force the change, yeah. and after your lovely chairman grounded you for a month for trying to discipline yes. the parents, <laughs> and you were <laughs> released again. But it's an important yeah. thing, because if we don't do it, we're being hypocritical about what we speak about. Yeah. 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 To that point, if we look at this time next year, so we're all here, it's November, it's November 2017, and we've seen the last 11 and a half months of how we've brought this to life. For each of you, what is the critical shift you want to see in the world per se's understanding around tourism and the value that it brings. What's the one critical shift that you can say, it worked? I'll start backwards, Mario. You know, when, when, when we talk about sustainability, most of us, I would say the majority of us, would actually think of the environment. And that's probably the first thing that comes to our mind. We think of paper, we think of uh, water consumptions, we think of different things like this. But quite often we forget about the social element of it, the impact on communities and people, economic impact that tourism can actually bring. And to me that is actually equally, if not even more important, that's the first driver. And uh, to, to be, you know, include diversity, to include everyone, to make it inclusive uh, when we talk about tourism, to show leaders within our, our sectors and leaders of the world the importance that tourism can actually bring to a country, to peace, uh, to better understanding of each other, to developing economically in certain regions. And if you allow me for just a few seconds to, to share a story. Um, we started about four or five years ago a project in the region of uh, Sapa, Sapa region uh, in Vietnam, which was an initiative driven by Capilano University in British Columbia, a community-based tourism project. 
And jointly with PATA, the PATA Foundation, the charity foundation, we started to actually work with a local community called the Red Zao, the lady that wears these red pillows on her head that le seems to be very heavy. Uh, but they, students went to the village and actually saw an opportunity to help this community to alle alleviate poverty and give them something new and something different to grow tourism sustainably within this area. The first year, the students actually talked to the ladies in the village, because it's a matriarchal society, ladies are the leaders, to explain to them what tourism was all about. And they were quite surprised that people would actually pay to come and spend time with them. It was a concept which was a little bit strange for them. Um, the second year actually helped them to build infrastructure. The third year about education of the tour operators about the products that were available. The fourth year, people were starting to come. And now there's uh, between 50 to 100 people coming and visiting this village every year and they've improved their life. Their children are able to go to school. Uh, one of the ladies went to Capilano University to do her bachelorship, and now will do a master, um, and they have a better life out of it. They understand, you know, this is what tourism can actually bring to them. Mm. And they have a pride of culture that they yes. can now celebrate. Mm. Brilliant. Susanna, please shift. Yeah, I, I feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm stealing something from you, but I was actually thinking before coming here that I would like to highlight the locality as well, mm -hmm. uh, because we often talk about international tourism and, and we, we then forget about domestic tourism, which is mm -hmm. equally important. And, and sometimes, um, especially in big countries like Canada or, or where else, I mean, the, the country is so diverse and, and it has so many different places that even the local people haven't seen it all. Um, and, and so I think we're still playing with this idea what next year will bring in, in terms of, of uh, maybe a new award, but I, I think it could be something, something that highlights that local aspect, maybe that domestic aspect of tourism, which is very important, and, and how, how I, I know in, in international travel, living the local is, is one of the slogan, slogans mm -hmm. already, so I think we should somehow highlight that as well. Brilliant. I must yes. say, because you, technically you were living sustainable tourism, because you just recycled one of Mario's ideas. Yes. So that, that, that <laughs> works. <laughs> that qualifies. Your Excellency, please. Um, I think I'd like to kind of think about it from the consumer perspective just for a moment, and I think it would be great if uh, at the end of 2017 we'd look back and we would think that as part of how consumers look at their travel experience and how they make decisions and selections about where to spend that discretionary dollar, that in addition to seeing beautiful places, eating wonderful food, that they would put a value on the choice of actually a cultural experience, an opportunity to, to learn about a different culture, to learn about a different society that will help to actually kind of enrich their outlook on the world. I think that that would be, uh, that would be a, huge, uh, a huge step forward. And that's, that's the perfect word on which to end this very brief, very quick discussion that whoever people are in this whole process, own it. Right. and own it for the year and let it go on beyond that itself. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our panel for this quick little conversation. And clearly, in Susanna's great sharing, if there's anything you do in 2017, if you can only do one thing, shower with a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you can take thank your you. seats. Thank you very thank you. much.